Hello, um, my name is Megan Navarro, the lead critic and journalist for Bloody Disgusting, and I am thrilled to be uh, moderating this series fest Q&A for the season two premiere of Nosferatu, which we've all just watched. Um, joining us today, we have the showrunner, writer, executive producer, Jamie O'Brien. Hey, everybody. <laughs> we have best-selling author of Nosferatu and executive producer, Joe Hill. Hi, folks. <laughs> We have the man behind the sinister, Charlie Manx, uh, and we nominated actor and producer, Zachary Quinto. Hello. And the <laughs> actress behind the formidable and terrifying Millie Manx, Matea Conforti. Hi. I wanted to start off by saying what a thematically appropriate uh, premiere for Father's Day weekend. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got Vic McQueen and Millie Makes very largely affected by the absence of their fathers. So I wanted to start off with you, Jamie, um, talking about maybe your approach to season two and, and the start of these character journeys. Um, wow, yeah, Father's Day. It, 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 uh, it escaped me that we were premiering on Father's Day, but you're right, we absolutely are. Um, it's interesting. I, um, I'll, I'll say a couple of things about Father's Day and Vic and her dad and Millie and her dad. Um, and uh, one of the, I guess I'll start with Vic. You know, I remember like last season, there was an episode, for those of you who watched season one, um, where Vic confronts her father, Chris McQueen, about his drinking. Um, and he says to her when she does, she the the reason she part of the reason she's able to do it is because she's just downed a couple beers right and so she has liquid courage to kind of confront him and he says you know what he says uh something along the lines of i i hope you never feel like what i feel like which is to disappoint your family and if you keep drinking i guarantee you'll find out and when we had that in the series i um i always thought of that it, it's he's he's warning her and he's also telling her the future um, and of course, because of where she came from, but I think largely because of some of the trauma that she experienced at the hands of Charlie Manx, when we find her, we discover that, oh, Chris was right, and she has kind of followed him down the same path, uh, even though that was never her intention, without even intending to. Um, and then in terms of Millie Manx, I mean, Millie has been, I think, living in Christmas land for, almost 100 years, at least 80. Uh, and uh, she hasn't seen her dad in eight years. And I think that um, she misses him. Um, but I also think that when the lights go out in Christmas land at the very beginning, she realizes that something's not right with her father. And I think that that's the first time that she has a real fear that Charlie Manx could die. Uh, and, uh, and, and then the, the next thought after my father could die, well, this place is in his imagination, really. So if he dies, what happens to me? Um, so she's grappling with this season. Who is her dad? Uh, is she going to follow in his footsteps? Is she safe with him? Um, and to a certain degree, Vic is asking the same questions about Chris. The um, Joe had a quote about horror that stuck with me, um, which is horror isn't about extreme sadism, it's about extreme empathy. And I think that Nosferatu uh, exemplifies that quote. So I was curious, Joe, how has it been for you to see Jamie really hone in on empathy? I mean, Charlie Manx is a character that I find myself understanding. Yeah, I... I love Charlie and I feel like I kind of get him, you know, I feel like maybe in, in a couple ways, um, I'm uncomfortably sort of like Charlie Manx, you know, um, Charlie is this guy who just wants children to be happy. He wants children to be safe and protected and, and every day for kids to be like Christmas, you know, and, um, you know, not to get too heavy, but years ago I got divorced and I have kids. And, you know, in the, in the weeks and months after the divorce, it was really important for me to make sure that they, you know, had great experiences in their lives, that great things were happening, that they were having fun, you know, and, 
And, and I was kind of maniacal about it. And then I had this moment where I sort of stepped back and I thought, wait a minute, they've gone through a divorce too. It's okay if they feel sad. You know, it's okay for them to have some bad feelings. But there was a part of me, this insidious part of me that wanted it to be like Christmas every day. You know, then I wouldn't, you know, I, I, it would be a way to sort of ease my own bad feelings, you know, my own feelings of, you know, sadness and stuff. And so that's sort of where Charlie comes out of. I mean, the, the, the sick and disturbing thing about Charlie, I think, is everyone understands the impulse, you know, to want to um, protect kids and, and, and see them have nothing but happiness in their lives. Um, have you had a lot of input story-wise um, for season two, or is it entirely Jamie's creation? Well, this is this is Jamie's version of the story. You know, I got my version on the page, and Jamie has her version on the screen. I kept my hand in, tried to help out where I could. Um, I wanted to ask Zachary. The premiere doesn't really show Charlie physically, but his presence still looms large. So I'm curious if you could talk about what it's been like to, to explore. This character still has layers we have yet to uncover. And also what's Charlie's headspace going to be coming out of this eight year kind of hiatus? Well, he's not thrilled. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's awakened in him a kind of thirst for revenge on some level. And, um, you know, I, I think that, yeah, it was, it was cool to, I mean, first of all, you know, the book has really been our, our guide, our template. Jamie's really managed in a great way, I think, to take Joe's vision and to flesh it out in a, a series format. And so I think all of us have used that as our guideposts along the way. Um, and, and this season fuels that as well. So, you know, when we meet Charlie in season two, he's incapacitated, he's weakened, he's, he's teetering on the edge of, of, of his own destruction. And I think when he um, overcomes that, he, he really wants to come out swinging and he does. And I think the landscape of the world that he left eight years previous is very different now. And so he spends some time sizing it up and evaluating the the best and most manipulative means of exacting that revenge on Vic McQueen. And that's sort of how we pick him up and where we, we go with him for a lot of the season. I also want to ask Matea, um, you seem to be, your character, Millie, seems to be coming into her own. I mean, she's had to take on a responsibility um, without her dad around. So it seems like this might be a season where Millie learns her independence. Can you talk about more about Millie? Well, season two, Millie, she's left alone for quite a long time. So she has to figure out how to manage Christmas land and all the other demon kids in Christmas land without her father there. So she kind of has to assume the role of being the leader for all the other children there. So this season, you're going to not just see her become more of a leader in Christmas land, but you're going to see her find her own self and how she can become more individual, but also still be reliant and still be um, kind of worshipful to her father. She's very much her father's daughter. There is a line that's very terrifying in the premiere, which uh, she tells Vic McQueen, my father will stick a fork in your eyes and pop them out like corks. <laughs> How is that to deliver a line like that? Are you, are you having a blast? Kind of. I mean, I definitely wouldn't say that in real life. <laughs> it's definitely something that Millie would say in this situation because I feel like that she feels threatened by these lights going out because she's never really had to be fearful of him dying because he's always played such a powerful role in her life and she's never had to worry about him in the real world outside of Christmas land before so she automatically thinks that Vic McQueen is hurting him or doing bad things to him. That line is straight from the novel by the way. 
oh, so we really? can date Joe. Yeah. I think it's terrible that Vic McQueen wants to break up Charlie's happy family. <laughs> Seems very unfair. But yeah, she's, she's awful. She's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a mutual destruction there. Um, I also want to mention uh, Jonathan Langdon as Lou. I mean, we've got these two very different, um, you know, with Vic McQueen's father and Millie's father, but we've got father of the year in Lou. I mean, he's such a good guy. Can you talk more about maybe casting Jonathan? We only got a glimpse of him at the end of season one, but he's, he's so lovable in the premiere. Uh, yeah. I mean, we, um, uh, we, we auditioned a lot of folks for Lou. And part of the, one of the things that was tricky last year when we were doing these auditions was that um, we didn't know if we were gonna have a season two. So we were kind of like, all right, you're only in one episode now and it's only like a couple of scenes, but they're good scenes. And then like, if we get a season two, you'll be like a really big part. Um, and so like, that was like kind of tricky to navigate with the actors. And also, I mean, Megan, you just put your, finger right on it like Lou is it's important um that we love this guy right off the bat uh it, in a in a world in which so many fathers are failing in the world of Nosferatu I think that um it was really beautiful that Joe created this character that's actually a good father <laughs> um so to kind of give us some hope um and also you know to kind of be a partner with Vic you know and part of Vic's journey is learning to accept this awesome guy. I don't think she's used to having awesomeness in her life. And so kind of initially, it's like she's weirdly uncomfortable around it. And um, even though she loves him dearly. And so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm delighted that Jonathan was able to kind of like, we were able to like thread that needle with him to be like, be on season one, but really be on season two. Because um, I think he's, he does fantastic work this year. But I think the interesting thing about the interesting thing about Lou is like Vic is a big capital H hero. Vic can do heroic things like, you know, ride a motorcycle into the heart of darkness to face an undead vampire, you know, and but Lou is kind of a lowercase H hero because he just shows up every day and he's kind to people. You know, he tries to be kind and steady and, and supportive. And I think in some ways that's a kind of heroism that isn't often celebrated in TV and films and stories, you know, because it's not very dramatic. No, but it's, it's, he's the, almost the least flawed in a way. He's, he's supporting her and offering stability, which is scary for her. Um, wanted to know if you could talk about Vic. I mean, we've got the fathers, but Vic seems in a very, very rough place following her father's missteps and the, the traumatic toll that her first encounter with Charlie has had on her. So what, what can we expect of our and like unwitting hero? Um, you know, I think that this season, one of the theme, one of the themes of the season is intergenerational trauma. Um, <laughs> you know, I know that sounds a little heavy, but it's true. And I think that like we have Vic and Wayne and we have Charlie and Millie and we're kind of telling that story um, from, you know, from, you know, I, I, Joe once said that Vic McQueen is 4th of July. If Charlie makes his Christmas, Vic McQueen is 4th of July. So we're kind of like telling the 4th of July version story um, and also the, the, you know, wintry Christmas story of um, intergenerational trauma. Um, we learn more about Charlie's backstory and some of the trauma that he's gone through in addition to Vic. And, uh, you know, I think the challenge for Vic is how do I... How, given the trauma that I've experienced, both in my family of origin and at the hands of Charlie Makes, how do I break that cycle for my child? Um, and I think when we meet her, she's afraid that she can't. You know, in episode one, I can say this because uh, now whoever's watching this will have seen it, um, but she, you know, she leaves her family um, very much like her father left 
her back in season one. And I, and I think that that's because, you know, she looks around at, at the evidence that she sees, which is, I can't control my drinking right now. I just burned down our house or nearly burned down our house. Um, Lou's an awesome guy and I don't deserve him. Wayne's an awesome kid and I don't deserve him. And the best thing that I can do is leave them. Now, I think that, you know, like, I think that there's a little bit of like the alcoholic selfishness in there too. Um, but anyway, I think that her journey this season is to kind of overcome all of that. And uh, when her, when Wayne is ultimately threatened by Charlie makes, that's when she realizes her role in protecting him and what she stands to lose by just kind of, you know, stepping back. I mean, I mean, one thing which is sort of interesting that the show does is occasionally it puts us in situations where we're uncomfortable with our hero's choices and, and also where we feel tremendous empathy for both Charlie and Bing, who are, who are the bad guys, you know, and I do think that the good art can do that. And I do, I, you know, I also think that in, in stories of horror, often it's possible to find a rich seam of emotion in the villains, that sometimes the villains, you you know, uh, are these these towering tragic figures that are kind of fascinating to explore, um, which is almost completely different from real life. Because in real life, most most people who are evil are are boring and insipid. You know, it's one of the things art can do is it can make the real world richer. Uh, that's very true with uh, Zachary's portrayal of Charlie. I mean, you, you, he's a, he's a very sinister guy, but his, his motivation seems pure. You know, he wants to take care of his children. Um, he's got very old fashioned values, which reads very differently in a modern setting. So um, I guess I'm curious, Zachary, like, how are you, Const I mean, this character is constantly evolving. We're learning more about his past and who he was and what shaped him. So I'm curious about your process in, in kind of developing him. Well, it's certainly true of this season. You really go back in time um, in some in ways to understand um, the accumulation of trauma that leads Charlie. You know, I, I think any villain um, has to be explored as an actor from a standpoint of what is the source of their worldview. Um, that's one question. And the other question is always, I think, uh, you know, where is the love? Where is the love as an actor for the character that you're playing? Where is the love or the lack of love for the character themselves? Um, so with Charlie, you know, again, I, I think the book is really, and, and the uh, accompanying graphic novel, um, which is really about Manx's um, journey, the Wraith, that, uh, that helps really flesh out the idea of the character from, a, from a, a, a standpoint of preparing to play him. And then, you know, the script this season really gives what Max could use to, um, to just calibrate his emotional state, you know, and, and we see him in his previous lives, um, you know, as a, as a father, str striving and struggling to provide for his family, um, for Millie. And, um, and, and then we see even further back his life as a child and how the deck was stacked against him from the beginning. And ultimately, he really didn't have a chance, um, sadly. And so I think it fosters a little bit more understanding and potentially a little bit more compassion for somebody who is so ruthless and manipulative and um, and bloodthirsty in a way that Manx becomes later in his life. Um, can we talk about the Wraith a little bit? Um, how are you, where did the Wraith come from? I mean, both from Joe and then trying to figure that out um, for the show, production-wise. Well, it's it's a huge part of this season, actually, the origin of the car. Oh. I think uh, I think we should just leave that for audiences to stay tuned and trust that they'll they'll get all the answers to those questions that they could possibly want. I hope. <laughs> but you know, yeah, there, there's a, you know the the wraith is clearly a character on the show, and so it has to be treated with the same kind of respect and. Um, and attention that all the rest of the characters need to be treated with. And, uh, and, and I think 
everybody does a great job of that, you know, from Jamie and the writers to, you know, um, Ben and Theo, who are the mechanics who are responsible for the car being operational when we need it to be. And, you know, there's a number of different cars that we use throughout the filming of the show. And depending on, I mean, I, the, 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 the effects magic that they've been able to achieve just in um, <laughs> having to go through everything it goes through, the destruction, the, you know, the stunt driving that needs to happen, like removing the Wraith body and putting it on the chassis of like a souped up Ford so that it looks like a Wraith, but it actually drives like a, you know, these kinds of accomplishments, I think, speak volumes of the skill level and the talent of, you know, the collaborative behind the scenes teams that come together to make a show like this, which is really complicated. And for me, you know, to to be the pilot of the car, to to, to drive it and to have a relationship with it that has to feel really kind of um, uh, inexorable and uh, and second nature and organic has been really fun. You know, it's uh, I've never had to do anything like that. And to factor that aspect of the experience into the performance and the character has been a real, a real treat. Well, Zach was behind the wheel the very first day of shooting in season one. Yeah. Um, his first day on the set, he was there with the, and it's not like driving a modern car, but I mean, I can't, I can't drive stick shift, you know, and this is not like a modern stick shift. It's like really, but he got it right away. He already knew what he was doing. Yeah. I had a good, uh, I had a good experience. I did take to it pretty easily. And then, and then it's about understanding the temperament of, of the 80 year old car that, you know, that we're all relying on in the sometimes frigid winters of Rhode Island. <laughs> and honestly, to, you can't really put too fine a point on, the team, Ben and yeah. Theo, who were the mechanics who kept that car running under all conditions. And I think there was maybe only once in both of the seasons that it was like more temperamental than the schedule allowed. And we had to kind of all like work around it. But other than that, I mean, it was really, they kept it humming for sure. Uh, I do have a few fan questions. Um, we have from Lisa Frank. Joe, what was the most challenging working on the adaptation from book to the series? Um, well, you know, the thing is, is Jamie did all the heavy lifting. So I wasn't, you know, um, it wasn't like it was a great sweat for me. Um, uh, you did the I, heavy lifting. You wrote the novel <laughs> and the graphic novel that the show is based on, though. <laughs> so yeah, I, I mean, I would say that was the heavy lifting. But yes, I'm. You know, so the thing is, is like I'm an executive producer on the show, and after two seasons, I really mastered the art of the job. Um, it turns out that if you're an executive producer, your your main work is to eat everything on the craft service table. <laughs> um, and then and then walk through the shot, pre preferably on your cell phone, like tapping away, preferably while a really emotional, heartbreaking scene is happening in front of the cameras. Um, and I do both those things. Like I took, I take to that like a duck to water. So, yeah. Um, from Sarah Helms, what was your favorite part of filming this season? I assume that could apply to Matea, Zachary, even Jamie. Matea, why don't you take it? I think, well, I don't know if I should say it because it's a spoiler, but it's definitely something that I've never done before in any other film production that I've done. <laughs> Uh-oh, that's a tease. Do you have anything, Zach? Um, I think, you know, this season was really, there were a lot of highlights for me. I think that the, the, the thing that the season builds to for me, and again, without giving too much away for people who haven't read the book, but for me, like the later episodes of the season and particularly the last two episodes of the season were the most electrifying. And I guess that that is kind of how it should be. But uh, yeah, it, it builds to a place that I was really happy to arrive at. Um, and I really enjoyed all the directors this season and all of the varied perspectives that were included in telling the story this year. Um, we had some really cool um, people come in. Um, Hanalee Culpepper, who directed some uh, an episode in the first season, did an episode in season two that was like a, an utter feat of 
And, and that's probably my favorite episode is, um, is one of the two that Hanali directed um, because of the intricacy and the complexity of the episode and the, just the sure handedness with which she executed it was so impressive to me and it made all of our jobs that much easier to have someone driving it forward that just was so capable. Is that um, episode five? Yeah, five or six. It is episode five. It's funny you say that, Zach. Uh, I was not on set when that episode right. was shot. I was back in LA and um, when I saw the director's cut of the episode, first of all, the script was written by um, one Tom of our Brady. executive producer, Tom Brady. And he, um, when I read the script, I was like, okay, this is amazing. I was like, there's no way we can produce this. And I was just waiting. I was like, we'll send it to the production team. And at some point they're going to tell me we can't do any of this and then we'll figure it out. And I kept waiting for that phone call to come. It never came. Um, I became distracted with other things because we were trying to finish writing the season. And, um, and then when I saw Hanali's director's cut, I just literally was, I sat there at the end of it, just like speechless um, because I could not believe what the whole team had accomplished. And I, you know, and it's funny, I, it, which is a testament to her and to the rest of the team. I reached out to her immediately and was like, I can't believe you did this. And she was like, you know, it's not me. It was our first AD. It, it's, it's all his fault that we were able to do this. I reached out to Jason, who's our first AD. He said, no, it was all Hanali. Kind of everybody was um, sharing in the, the, the blame for it. Um, <laughs> But I'm, I, it's probably, it's, it's one of my favorite episodes of the series as well. You know, we, yeah, and, it's, and it comes at a moment when during, in production, it was like kind of right in the middle of the whole process. And we were into like, we were just tipping into the Rhode Island, you know, late fall, early winter. And um, it was just really, and we cross-boarded. So like when you asked Joe if it's episode five, we would shoot two episodes at once. Mm -hmm. And so right. the schedule was never so clearly delineated that you even knew exactly you didn't shoot chronologically. We didn't shoot chronologically in terms of like, this is episode one, then two and three. We do one and two together, three and four together, five and six and so on. And, uh, and so that one got, it was blended into the next episode as well. And just, it was just, it was really fun. It was really, I, I was dreading it, frankly, going into it. And we had this rehearsal like on location where we were shooting at this campground in Rhode Island and like, you know, I remember pulling into the parking lot the first morning of rehearsal and just being like, this is going to be a nightmare. And it was actually the most fun I probably had on the whole, on the whole uh, season. It was really cool. And I'm excited for people to see that one. I think the whole season runs really hard. You know, I'm a momentum guy. You know, I, I like a story that runs like an 18 wheeler going downhill with no brakes. Mm -hmm. And I feel like season two really does that. It's, it's really aggressive. It runs really hard. I also think there are a couple moments, the last couple episodes of season two, episode five, um, that just kind of explode everything you thought was, you know, you, when you feel like you've got the show figured out and you know what can, it can do, and then, and then it kind of explodes all your expectations and takes the show in a, you know, to a different place. And I love that kind of thing. You know, I, I, uh, I love to feel like, oh, wow, there's, you know, there's so much more here to discover. There's so much more here that's possible. Between the uh, teases that you've all given me for season two and the premiere that we just watched, I feel it appropriate to remind everybody to tune in every Sunday on AMC at 9 p.m. Central. You know, watch it. We want more of it. And that's the only way it's going to happen. Um, and one final <laughs> question from Francoise de Marier. Was there someone specific, either real or imaginary, that influenced the portrayal of Charlie Manx? Francoise. Um... You know, I was really, I, I don't, I don't tend to base performances or um, interpretations of characters on other performances and other interpretations of characters. Um, I, I really used the book. This is the first time, uh, it's actually not the first time, but, but in such a, 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 the roadmap of the book and the graphic novel that Joe created was such a gift. And I used it throughout my experience of both seasons. Um, you know, and Jamie and I talked a lot about it and I felt like all of the questions that I had were answered in one of those texts. Um, and if they weren't, then I sort of turned to Jamie to kind of, you know, really be my, um, 
my my compatriot in deciphering who this guy is and what motivates him. So for me, it was much more about um, Manx is a man kind of out of time and figuring out the way to navigate that and integrate it in a believable and grounded way was my goal. And um, it's been a blast so far. I can't believe that we're at this point already and um, sharing it, you know, with the world at this particular moment as well. I think, you know, it's, um, it's difficult to contextualize this um, in, in what's going on in a larger sense. I think it's important that we acknowledge um, that we invite people to go on this journey, but you know, we also respect and understand um, the attention that needs to be paid to the larger issues socially and politically that are happening in the world right now. Um, and everybody on this call is aware of that and, and we've all engaged in, in a lot of different ways. And I, and I encourage people to also do that you know, as we're moving forward because this, this is an extraordinary time in a lot of ways. So um, just acknowledging that I think is important. Yeah, at the end of the day, it's a it's a it's a fun TV show, and maybe maybe it's a chance to take a breath, you know, and 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 you know, give yourself a little mental vacation. Um, we're living in highly charged, very stressful um, times, and and we may get to the other side of them, and and you know, find our find the whole country in a much better place, much healthier place, you know, much but but you got to go through the bad to get to the the good, the tough stuff to get to the. So at the end of the day, it's a it's a it's a fun tv show and and hopefully you know it gives people a little pleasure and then the next day it's it's you know it's it's back to the hard work uh making a country that's worth living in very true thank you thank you very much i think that that we have hit the end of our time so yeah everybody tune in on sundays check it out thank you so much for uh for giving us an opportunity to talk about it. And um, thanks everybody for, for joining us.